Welcome to Living Faith from the Russellville Christian Center. Planting the seed of truth and growing families in the Word of God. The Lord's been dealing with me on this thought this week. No vacancy. And as we were singing that song, I was just thinking all back through the week as the Lord began to deal with me on this, on this subject is who are we making room for? What are we making room for? Because our hearts are like this open building, Kyle, and it's up to us what we allow to come in and what we allow to stay out. And as we were singing that song, I thought that's been, I know that sounds so elementary, but that was the key that just unlocked everything for me on what my heart has been pondering on this week is, Lord, I want to unlock the door to my life, and I don't want anything but you coming in. And specifically, God's Word. God, I believe God's Word, I mean, the price that was paid for it to be that we can have it in hand today I'm, I'm not talking about just the apostles and, and the prophets. I'm talking about people that translated this into the language that we can read. Uh, I can't remember the guy's name, but I remember hearing the story that they would travel from England to the Americas, and they would take pages out of the Bible and hide it on themselves. That way, when they got over to America, they could put it all together and bind it together and begin to distribute it. And there were a lot of people that lost their life because they got caught with pages of the Word of God on them. So a great price has been paid by Jesus most of all. But people have paid a dear price that we can have the Word of God. And I'm saying that to say this. I don't want anything but God's Word on the inside of me. When I come to situations... I don't want anything other than God's word coming out of my mouth, Kyle. I don't want, I'm not focusing on Kyle this morning. He's just a good focal point. <laughs> but when I come to situations, I even the thoughts in my mind, I want it to be the word of God. That's all the vacancy that I want to have on the inside of me is God's word. So let's be turning to the book of Matthew, if you would. I'm going to do my best to teach this morning, but there's a couple in, of, of points here that I really feel like I could preach. And if, if the Lord leads that way, we will. But it just, you know, when you get excited, it's hard to hold it back. And why should we? We, we got something to be excited about. Amen. We got a lot to be excited about. Uh, I love the part of that song, uh, breaking down the walls of religion, of tradition, Man's thinking, man's view, breaking all that down because you know what? God's way is better. God's way is so much better. Last week, we uh, celebrated the resurrection. And what a great day it was, wasn't it? To get to celebrate and remember our risen Savior and the price that he paid, but also the victory that he won. He didn't just, he's not in the grave, he's not on the cross. The Bible says that he's on the right hand of God, interceding for us. And I, I was thinking, there are probably people all over the world that were born again last week. There may have been even people here uh, that asked Jesus into their heart. But this is what uh, God began to deal with me on that this morning was, that in, in a lot of religious circles, when the person gets born again, it's the end. But in the reality, it's just the beginning. You've, you, we have just started. There's so much more. It's just the beginning. Matthew 16 and 13. If you're there, say, I choose. I choose. If you wonder what we're talking about, you need to go back and listen to Bubba's message a few Wednesday nights ago. And I, I thought about that on the, way to, on the way down here this morning, Bubba. What we make room for is our choice. It's our choice what we make room for. 
The Bible says when Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his, his disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And they said, Some say that thou art John the Baptist, some Elias, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. And he saith unto them, But whom say ye that I am? I thought that's a very powerful. That, every time I read that, that just sends shockwaves through my spirit because Jesus said, I, don't, I really don't care, really. I know he asked them, but the reality you can tell was in this question who he cared about, who thought about him. Does that make sense? <laughs> who do you say that I am? That's what he cared about. And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Now keep in mind, Peter's not an educated man. He's not schooled. The only thing that he really knows is what he's been told. If you, if you do a lot of research, you'll find that a lot of the disciples didn't know how to read. They didn't know how to write. They were fruit pickers. They were fishermen. They were dirt farmers. These were not educated people. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto you, but my Father which is in heaven. I'm not against education this morning. I'm not against learning or anything like that. But when the Holy Spirit reveals something to you, Brother Terry, it's different. It's different. Jesus went on to say in verse 18, He said, And I say also unto thee, that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Now, I know that we all are in agreement that uh, Jesus was not building the church upon Peter, but he, and thank goodness, <laughs> but he was building on the confession and the belief that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. It is more than just saying, it's believing. You've got to believe it. Uh, coming to Christ is not just an insurance policy. Uh, what do we call it? Hell insurance. It is a confession that we build upon. Amen. We build upon that. And Romans 10, verses 9 and 10, it says that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Now we have to remember also the parable, and I didn't get a chance to uh, look this up, but where Jesus had said that the wise man built his house upon the rock, and there was one of the Gospels that said that he dug until he found rock. And then he began to build his house on that rock. And we build our house, our spiritual house, upon the confession and the belief that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And you might say, well, John, these are things that we know. We've known this since children's church. But I want to tell you today that I heard something this week that really bothered me, that there are religious circles, and there are religious circles in this area that will argue against this. That it takes more than just saying something and believing something. And I want to tell you, I believe in regeneration. I believe there should be a noticeable change in somebody's life when they get born again. I'm in full agreement with that. But there's a lot of times where there are a lot of churches that are looking for an outward showing. Yeah. When somebody comes in and they're, they're a drunk or they're high on dope and they don't know the Lord, we'll go to them and we'll tell them, hey, Jesus loves you and he'll forgive you and he wants to set you free. But you let that, and they'll, they'll come to Christ and they'll confess him and they believe in their heart. But you let them come, and, and there's a lot of areas that you let them come drunk and high the next week and they'll condemn them. They'll, they'll make them feel like they're, they're something lower class. And I'm going to tell you today, I believe that the saving power of Jesus Christ is far above what I do. 
I'm not talking about a right to go out and do what you want to do. But see, I'm building my house upon the confession that Jesus is Lord. That he is the son of God. And it's all about what he has done, not about what I'm doing. Because I want, I want you to know this. I'm, I'm speaking a lot of this today because my background was a lot about self-effort. And that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make a statement now that I was planning on making later. Well, I'm, I'm going to wait and do it later. <laughs> I'm not here. I want to say this really quickly. I'm not here to bash other churches at all. That's not my goal. I love the, our churches in this area. I've got friends right now that are very good friends of mine that are part of other churches that are, that are preaching and teaching the word of faith. Okay? That's not what I'm trying to say. But it really bothered me when I heard that statement this week that it takes more than just confessing and believing. Because you see, when we confess and we believe, we're not stating our own opinion. We're stating what God's word says. When we can't take the word of God and say, that's the final authority in my life, you're on dangerous ground, friend. If you're relying off of what your, what your uh, denomination says, if you're relying on what religion says, if you're, if you're uh, relying on what tradition says, you might be outside of the will of God. And this, is, this may seem like a really bold statement. And this is my opinion. Okay, so I want to say this real quickly. Don't run to Pastor Susan. This is my opinion, and I want to say this is my opinion. I don't believe the greatest threat to the church is transgenderism or homosexuality or anything else that's kind of on the news nowadays. I believe the greatest threat to the church is people that confess to be a Christ follower and believe and teach contrary to what Jesus said and taught. I'm not, as I said before, I'm not against feeling. I'm not against emotion. But I understand this, that when I leave here today, as beautiful of a presence that was in this room here this morning, that there's a possibility that when I leave here today, I may not feel what I would like to feel. And I've got to know what God's word says. I've got to. I need to know exactly what I call myself a Christ follower I call myself a disciple. I have to be relying on what the teacher taught me. Let's turn to Luke chapter 24. We taught, a uh, pastor taught on this last week. And of course, as I was preparing this week in my heart, I, this just really, can I say you uh, wrecked me a little bit? <laughs> if, we, if I know that might be last year's word. But if you see in Luke 24, I'm going to try to just kind of do my best to paraphrase here for, for time's sake. We read that where the women, I believe it's Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, uh, that went to the sepulcher and saw the angel of the Lord and they got excited and they ran back and told his disciples that he is risen. And it said, if you, if you look in Mark chapter 9, I'm just going to read this real quickly, don't turn there. It says, for he taught his disciples, this was talking about Jesus, and said unto them, the son of man is delivered into the hands of men and they shall kill him. And after that he is killed, he shall rise the third day. Now I want you to understand that the emphasis here is on for he taught his disciples. He did not just say it one time to his disciples. He taught them this, which the word taught in the Webster's Dictionary is to impart knowledge. He imparted the knowledge. So I want you to, the reason I'm saying this and being emphatic on this is I want you to understand this is not something that Jesus said to them just haphazardly one day. He taught them this. And if you look back in Luke 24 and verse 11, whenever the women came and told him that he had, he had risen from the dead, that the disciples looked at them and it says, and their words seemed to be as idle tales, and they believed them not. 
after the, the very same disciples, the same Christ followers, that Jesus had taught exactly what was going to happen, and they knew exactly what they were talking about, that they said that it was as idle tales to them and they would not believe, even though Jesus taught them. They were, the women were only repeating what they had been told. It was not their opinion. It was not what they had been stooped in religion. It was what they had been taught. That's what they had been told. They were only repeating what they had been told. So I want you to turn to Mark chapter 11. Do y'all know where that's at? I'm not trying to be solemn this morning, but I just want you to understand the gravity of not following God's word and how dangerous that it is that when we get another thought or another idea in our mind other than exactly what we read on the words of this page. And as we were in worship, I was, and I'll get to Mark 11 here in just a minute, I was thinking about, uh, I'm a, pioneers are a big thing for me. I love to read and to hear stories and I ask a lot of questions about Pastor Tom. I didn't know him like a lot of you people knew him. And I, I, but in my mind, I tried to envision what it was like to pioneer a church. You look around at everything, everything that we're doing now. Now, I, understand, I give credit to Pastor Susan, what a great leader she is. But it took somebody spearheading and starting and I believe really what that was was not, well, let's figure up another doctrine and another denomination and let's make some new bylaws and let's just start another church. I believe probably what happened there, judging by the stories that y'all have told me, was a hunger on the inside of him for truth and to teach it and to bring deliverance to people, not to entrap them even further in, in religious, turning from the world's kind of bondage to just go right into religious bondage. So let's look at Mark chapter 11. And I want to, I want to read this, even though we know it. But we read it anyways, right? And Jesus entered uh, into Jerusalem and into the temple. And when he had looked around about upon all things, and now the eventide was come, he went out unto Bethany with the twelve. And on the morrow, when they were come from Bethany, he was hungry. Because see, a lot of circles today will tell you this is, a, this is a passage that is talking about spiritual things. Just spiritual things. But the Bible says in verse 12, when he came from Bethany, he was hungry. Now, I believe his, what it was saying there was his body was hungry. I'm sorry, I have to keep pulling these on and off here. In verse 13, it says, and see, is it okay if I teach a little bit? Is that all right? I'm, I'm not bored here this morning, okay? I'm just trying, I'm trying to get to something, all right? And seeing a fig tree afar off having leaves, he came, if happily he might find anything thereon, and when he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for the time of figs was not yet. And Jesus answered and said unto it, No man eat fruit of thee hereafter forever, and his disciples heard it. Now let's skip to verse 20, like I had to tell you that. And in the morning, as they passed by, they saw the fig tree dried up from the roots. And Peter, calling to remembrance, saith unto him, Master, behold, the fig tree which thou cursed is withered away. And I always say this. I don't think that Peter just said, well, man, Jesus, look, that fig tree you cursed withered up. I believe he was astonished, like, I almost, this is unbelievable. Kind of almost too good to be true. In verse 22, it's, and Jesus answering saith unto them, have faith in God. Really, a better translation there would be, have the faith of God. But in verse 23, it says, For verily I say unto you, that whosoever shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, and be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he saith shall come to pass, he shall have whatsoever he saith. 
Therefore I say unto you, what things soever ye desire, when ye pray, believe that ye receive them, and ye shall have them. Now there are people that are call themselves Christ followers that will read this and not believe it. They will teach against it. And they think that they're doing God a favor. And they'll say, well, he was talking about spiritual matters here. I'm going to tell you, there's nothing spiritual about a fig tree. Nothing spiritual there. And so, and what is so funny is that they will, and I'm, like, I'm getting to a point where I'm going to, I want to show you my love that I have for people, okay? I'm not just here browbeating people. But they will talk about, they'll read about Thomas and how that he said, you know, I won't believe unless I touch his hands and I feel his side. I won't believe. And, you know, Jesus come in and said, touch my hands, touch my side. And, of course, Thomas said, well, now I believe. But then what did Jesus say? He said, blessed are those that don't see and believe anyways. Okay, so here was, here's the deal. They'll t we'll talk about doubting Thomas. But then when we come to Mark chapter 11, a lot of religious circles will look. I'm just telling you the danger of listening to things you don't need to be listening to. Um, they'll read this and they will say, well, that's just idle tales. There's a, lot of, there's a lot of people today that call themselves Christ followers that will say, I'll believe it when I see it. And, you know, there are a lot of people, uh, they're not going to let the Bible get in the way of what they believe. Thank you for that thunderous silence. <laughs> I know you're taking notes. But this is really the meat of where I really felt like God was dealing with me hard this week was when I read this passage of scripture, and I'm, I'm saying this, I, I want you to understand, I want to slow down for a second and remind you of where I'm coming from. Because there was a time in my life where I preached against this stuff. I thought it was idle tales. I thought it was wishful thinking. And in my mind, I thought to myself, there's got to be a deeper point to that. When we read this, a lot of times we forget who was talking here. And, and another thing, too, is, uh, you know, when I was preaching this stuff, I'm not going to put the burden on nobody else. I'm going to talk when I was standing up in front of people and telling them there's nothing to that stuff. It's heresy. You need to leave it alone. And, you know, because I would say, well, I tried that. <laughs> I asked God for that and it didn't happen. So it can't be true. Never enter in my mind that the problem may not be the word or the problem might be me. They'll try it out, test drive it, Brett. They'll test drive Mark 11. And if it doesn't work, well, it can't be real. There's nothing to that. It didn't happen to me. I thought, man, how prideful must I have been, Malin, when God showed me this. Who is talking here? Well, of course, in our minds we say, well, Jesus. Jesus is doing the talking. And as the day went on, I kind of felt like whenever Jesus was asking Peter, do you love me? <laughs> And he's like, yeah, and, and Peter become wearied with him. Because as the day went on, I felt like God was saying, who said that? And I'm like, well, Jesus said that. And then the question came, no, who said that? Take it a little bit further. And I thought, well, Jesus, the Son of God. That seems like that's got a little bit more emphasis on it, right? So I thought maybe, okay, I see where you're going, kind of where you're going here. And I feel like the Lord asked me again, no, who said that? And I was like, okay, Jesus, the Son of God, and this thought come to me, my Lord and Master. And of course, another, one more, a couple more here. I felt like the Lord asked me one more time later in the day, no, who said that? 
And this came to me, Jesus, the Son of God, my Lord and Master, the head of the church. The head of the church or the head of the body that I say I'm connected to. And I thought about this, when the brain gives a body a command, it doesn't argue, it responds. When the brain gives the body a command, it doesn't argue, it does not debate, it does not say, I don't believe, it responds. If you stick your hand on a hot stove, your brain is going to immediately tell you to move. And have you ever burnt your hand before? My hand did not argue with my brain. It didn't say, I don't believe that. It moved accordingly. When we read God's word, we need to realize we're not just hearing a man talking. We're hearing the head of the body that we say we are connected to. So when I read what so things, therefore I say unto you, what things soever you desire, when you pray, believe that you receive them and you can have them, I'm not going to argue with that statement. I'm going to respond to that statement. That is the point that I'm, I'm not here to run other people down. I realize this. We are not the only church. I know that. We know in part. But we have to have a heart that says, this, Father, I want, to, I want to be what you want me to be. Because God woke me up very early uh, Friday morning. And this was the statement that he, I had to get up and write it down really quick. So I'm going to try to read this chicken scratching. Um, <laughs> The importance of walking in obedience is it unlocks understanding. And the reason that is, it's not so important that you know everything immediately. That's why I don't believe in instant sanctification because the Bible says that Jesus grew in, in wisdom and in stature with God and man. If Jesus needs to grow, there's a great possibility that I'm going to need to grow too. Okay, so what I'm trying to say, it's not about that you know everything, but I got the heart to say, Father, as you bring me into revelation of your word, I'm not going to argue with you. I'm not going to debate with you. I'm going to respond to you. So that leads me to this week's title, No Vacancy. When the enemy comes by or tradition or religion, and believe it or not, I hate to say it this way, but I don't know how else to say it, that the enemy can use religion and tradition the same way he can use gross misconduct. And we have to have a mindset that, Lord, there is no vacancy in my heart and in my life for anything that is contrary to your word. And if there is something in my life that is contrary to your word, it's leaving. It's got to go. Luke chapter 11 it says this, But when a stronger than he shall come upon him and overcome him, he taketh from him all his armor, wherein he trusted and divided his spoils. He that is not with me is against me. Whew. When Jesus said Mark in Mark 11 and 22 through 24, when he said that, I believe what he said, hey, if you're not with me on this, you're against me. When the unclean spirit is gone out of a man, he walketh through dry places seeking rest and finding none. He saith, I will return into my house whence I came out. And when he cometh, he find it swept and garnished. What we fill our life with is just as important as being clean on the inside. When, if we don't fill our lives with the word of God... Then the, I'm going to tell you, have, has anybody ever had the enemy come by and check you on stuff that you used to do? Or is it just me? Sure. But you know, when you're full of God's spirit and you're full of his word, he may come by and check you, but he's going to immediately know 
There's no room here. It's as good as having a no vacancy sign on the door. I don't have room for you here. And you know, if somehow or another he gets his foot in the door just a little bit, we kick it out and we slam the door shut. We have to have a mindset of no vacancy. I want to say one more thing very boldly. There are people that get born again and they start hearing the wrong teaching that is contrary to the teaching of Christ and they end up in more bondage than they were before. I want to say this very delicately because where I was a few years back was in my life. I thought, God, I'm, I'm doing everything right that I know to do. I'm not cussing, dipping or chewing or running with those that do. I'm not doing any of those things, but yet I still felt like, what is it? What am I missing? And it was this, this peace. There was just no peace. There was no freedom. I'm thinking, I should be, I should be more free than anybody. And uh, Andrew Womack, I, I, I want to say uh, it wasn't a mistake, but I mean, you, <laughs> when you listen to Andrew Womack, you better have your, your steel toe shoes on. And he said, you know, I, he said, I've never drank, and this blows my mind at 65 years old. He said, I've never drank alcohol. I've never smoked a cigarette. He said, I've never used a word of profanity. He said, I've never even drank a cup of coffee. I'm not saying coffee's wrong. I'm just saying, I'm just saying you know, he said, I was as good as I could be. I, religiously, I was, I was perfect, but there was still something missing on the inside of me. And I realized it was this, I was dependent on myself more than I was dependent on what Jesus had done for me. There is a bondage, and when it's you keeping you saved, when it's, as uh, Cherie talked about, the sin in, in the Timothy Project, the sin of self-reliance. I forgot we were a Timothy Project. Her and Brother Johnny and, and Dalton did such a great job but she talked about the sin of self-reliance. And when we start depending on ourselves, it's almost like, hey, thank you, Lord, for getting me right here. I'll take it from here. When we really need to be saying, hey, this is just the beginning. And I'm not saved by what I do. I'm not saved by all the good things that I do. I am saved because of the blood of Jesus Christ. And his word is developing me. I am building the foundation of my house upon him. So don't get in religious bondage. Be free. And I know religious circles today, my friends around me will say, you're just teaching people that they can just sin however they want to sin. And I want to tell you today, if that is your mindset, you got the wrong mindset. Because when you walk in obedience, you also unlock understanding. I'll tell people all day long, you're not going to go to hell because you're drinking. But it sure ain't doing your body any favors. You're just, I mean, the reason that God doesn't, you know, talked about wine being a strong drink and a mocker and any man that partakes of it is a fool. The reason he said that was because whenever you overindulge in that, you're wrecking your body. You're going to have a tough life. It's not that way because God said it. God said it because that's the way it is. He's not trying to keep you from having a good time. He's trying to keep you uh, from living a life of bondage and you living in freedom. So this isn't about just go sin all you want to go sin. Because Paul said, I believe it was in Romans 6, he said that if we're, if we're dead to sin, should we live any longer there in it? Shall I sin that grace can abound? He said, God forbid. So I'm not trying to give anybody an avenue on that. I'm just helping you understand for what helped me when I realized it had nothing to do with what I was doing. It, it lifted a weight off of my shoulders. And it helped me to understand that I'm saved because of what Jesus has done. And that's it. In Mark, Mark chapter 4 and verse 24, this is really what, this, I thought this was so awesome. Because, you know, when God gives you something and you know God gave it to you, and, and a lot of times I'll, I'll take my sticky note on my desk and I'll write it down and I'll just kind of slap it over to the side. But this was one of the statements in Mark 4 and 24. And Jesus was talking and, and says, And he said unto them, Take heed what you hear. What am I listening to? 
I'm not talking about rock music. I'm not saying you need to listen to rock music. I'm not talking about TV programs. I'm talking about who are you listening to that says they are teaching the Word of God. The reason it matters where you go to church is it matters what you are hearing. Because I've had people tell me about individuals, at least they're going to church somewhere. No. I love other churches. I love people. I'm not saying we're the only ones. It's not what I'm saying. But I'm saying I hear a lot of things that I'm like, you know, whenever a church will tell somebody, it takes more than confessing and believing. I'm not going to send them over there. I'm not going to send them to that stuff. When the very head of the church, the head of the body, inspired Paul to write, if you believe in your heart and you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus Christ and you call upon his name, you shall be saved. Why would I tell them anything different? Because it ain't me saying that, it's the head of the church. Who am I listening to? It should cause a little bit of righteous indignation on the inside of us. That people have walked away feeling like they aren't good enough. They've confessed it with their mouth. They believe it in their heart. But they get under condemnation because they might have said a cuss word yesterday. I mean, we read in scriptures where Peter denied that he even knew him. I can't think of anything worse. And listen, I'm not bashing other people because he, I, I want to show you, I read this today and it's like, this, this helps me so much. Romans chapter 10. But I'm going to say this as you're turning there. When you, you know, you hear this stuff a lot, but when you hear it local, it really just... <sighs> Paul said, brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. Does that sound like Paul hated, his, hated the Israelites? Did it say, sound like he hated the Jews, even though that they were believing something totally different than the, than the gospel of Jesus Christ? He said, for I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. There's a lot of people today that's got a zeal for God, but it's not according to knowledge. They say they got a zeal for Jesus Christ, but they're going contrary against what his word says. And they'll look at us and say, how dare y'all believe that? And I'm like, hey, I'm only doing what the head told me to do. Pardon me if I don't listen to you. He said, for they be ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. I, want, I just want to stop right there. Let's go to verse 8. He said, verse 8, I, I like this. He said, but what saith it? The word is nigh thee. Whose word? God's word. Not my word. Not my opinion. Not what I think. Not what I believe. But what God's word says. He said, "Is even in thy mouth and in thy heart, that is the word of faith which we preach. I'm not talking about word of faith as in a doctrine. I'm talking about the word of faith as when I read the word of God and it says, whatsoever things you desire when you pray, believe that you receive them and you shall have them. I want to declare, quit putting limits. I want to be the first to tell you that the head of the church told you, quit putting limits on me to do what I want to do in your life. And quit leaning on somebody else's understanding and start leaning on the understanding of his word. Quit apologizing. We got to quit apologizing for believing this. And then Luke, you know, we, we read in Mark 4 and 24 where it says, take heed what you hear. And then... I, I heard Keith Moore say this, and he, he wasn't even really expounding on it. He just said it, and I was just listening to him as I was doing something else. But it may, he made this statement. I had to stop and write it down. He said, where Mark 24, Jesus said, take heed what you hear. And in Luke 8, Jesus said, take heed therefore how you hear. 
Of course, I was like, how you hear? How else can you hear? You know, you hear with your ears. But as I began to look further in the same chapter, Luke's gospel said this, starting in verse 19. It says, Then came to him his mother and his brethren, and could not come at him for the press. And it was told him by certain which said, Thy mother and thy brethren stand without desiring to see thee. And he answered and said unto them, My mother and my brethren are these which hear the word of God and do it. We need to take heed how we hear, because how we need to hear this is this. I'm not just going to hear it, but I'm going to hear it and do it. That's how I need to be hearing. It's not just hearing it, but practicing it. So when I hear the truths in God's word, because I'm going to tell you, people will get angry. Oh, they'll get mad. I, I, I read this and in worship this morning that was coming back to my mind. The Holy Spirit brought it back to my mind. Is in Mark chapter, Mark chapter 10. Because I know that they'll talk about, um, I don't believe in that sowing and reaping. And I'm like, well, I didn't say it. <laughs> I, I'm not just... I didn't just pull this stuff out of thin air, Brother Bob. I'm just reading what the Word says. In verse 29, and Jesus said, because let me tell you, when you, the, the, the part about the prosperity that people don't want to hear is that you have to give something in order to receive something. And I'm talking about just in sowing and reaping. Now, you can't earn your salvation. You receive that freely. Uh, you don't earn the gift of the Holy Spirit. You receive that freely. But there's a lot of places in the Bible that talks about the law of seed, time, and harvest. And this is a New Testament version of that. In verse 29, And Jesus answered and said, Verily I say unto you, There is no man that hath left house or brethren or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or lands for my sake and the gospel's, but he shall receive an hundredfold now in this time, houses and brethren and sisters and mothers and children and lands, get this, with persecutions. You start getting blessed, and I'm going to tell you right now, the, the religious world will come down on top of you. They rake, I'm not going to name names, but they'll rake ministers across the coals because they've got a lot of stuff. But you know the one thing they never investigate? What they gave. They won't investigate that. But you see, there was a time in my life where I was the same way. <laughs> they ought to be giving that stuff to the poor. Who's that sound like? That's a, that's a compartment I don't want to get put in, Right? They don't investigate that. But here is the thing. They're, 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 like I said, they're not going to investigate that. And it'll come with persecution. There'll be a time when you're pulling up to the gas tank and can afford gas and people are going to get mad at you. Because you can afford to pay for your gasoline. Anyways, we didn't write this stuff. The head of the church did. And I'm not saying that there will not be a price for following him. Because it says right here, with persecutions. I'd love to tell you that when you get saved, that it's all pie in the sky, but it's not. There's sometimes that there's, there's people and things that will come against you, but whenever you're full of God's word, it's like, I've, I heard somebody give this, when, you're, when you uh, described it this way, when you are, if you've got a five-gallon bucket and it is full to the brim with water and you bump them, what's going to come out? So if your life is full of God's word, when you get bumped, what's going to come out? When life comes at me and, the, and, 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 I, and it bumps me and out comes the word of God rather than what I feel or what everybody else is saying, you know, if it wasn't for good, bad luck, I wouldn't have any luck. That was one, what was the hee-haw, was that the hee-haw anointing, Mark? <laughs> Gloom, despair, agony on me, deep, dark depression, excessive misery. <laughs> Sounds great, don't it? I know churches today that shout the house down on that one. 
if the music got right and the tempo got right. All right. <laughs> How we hear, the way we hear is we hear the word of God and we do it. James chapter 1. It says, Wherefore lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness and receive with meekness the engrafted word. Notice he said the engrafted word, not man's opinion, which is able to save your souls. But be you doers of the word. <laughs> Say, I'm a, doer. I'm a doer. Say it one more time. I'm a, I'm a doer. I'm not just a hearer. Because it says right here in verse 22, when I hear and don't do, I'm deceiving myself. For if any man be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like unto a man beholding his natural face in the glass. For he beholdeth himself and goeth his way and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. When we read that story about the disciples, when Jesus told them, taught them, they're going to deliver me up, they're going to crucify me, but I'm going to rise on the third day. He taught them that, but guess what? It was like they were looking in a mirror when they walked away, Mayla, and they forgot who they were. I don't want to forget what God's word says, and I don't want to forget who's saying it. Verse 25, but whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein. That's what I love. God's word is not a schoolmaster anymore. God's word is the law of liberty and freedom. And if you talk to people about freedom and peace today, they'll say, sign me up. You hand them the word of God, they're going to be like, oh, wait a minute. You're talking about following a bunch of rules and it'll be good sometime later down the road. But Jesus said this when he was teaching the disciples how to pray. He said, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Well, what I try to tell people is this. There was times in my life where I would read that model prayer and I would skip right past that part. Never saw it. But there was a time where God dealt with me and can I tell a story? Are you, are you in a hurry? Okay. There was a lady called that needed, she needed some gasoline the other day and protocol is around here if a lady calls. I, there's two of us go. And uh, I didn't know who this was. But we went and put gas and me and Pastor went and put gas in her tank. And it was right by where I started my ministry at. And we drove right by, the, by that place. Love them. Great people. Love them. They've been good to me. Still to this day, when I see them, I just, it's like a reunion. But I remember sitting in that office at 4.30 in the morning saying, there's something more I'm missing on. And I, I knew God was... God was pulling me to leave. Not because they were bad people. Not because they weren't good to me. Not because they did not love me. I mean, Larry, David, Martha are some of the finest people on the earth. And I'm telling you, when they, they, it was one of those when you announced you were resigning, they brought you up to the front and everybody come around and hugged your neck crying and weeping. And I'm going to tell you, there was a lot of times I, I could have changed my mind. But I knew God was pulling on my heart. But you see, if I didn't go, there were parts of the word that I'm not saying they weren't teaching it as in they didn't believe it. I'm just saying I would come in here and they, whenever pastor started teaching on the, prayer, the model prayer that Jesus gave, I... The first time in my life, I saw thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And I was like, where have I been all my life? <laughs> and the reason that is, it's not because they don't love the Lord. I'm telling you right now, if they got a hold of the faith message, they would turn this world upside down. But God brought me to this. That's the importance of walking in obedience is it unlocks understanding. It become a revelation to me. And I'm not telling people you got to leave your church in order to get understanding. That's not 
what I'm saying. Because if you try to leave here, we're going to, I can't ride a horse. But I'll drive a truck and I'll lasso you down and we'll pull you back in here. You're not leaving. (laughs) But that's the importance of saying, God, I'm going to be obedient to your word and what it says to do. And then it's going to unlock understanding. And then you can walk in freedom. Amen. Would you stand with me? No vacancy. No vacancy for self. No vacancy for just religion. The only thing that I want to leave room for in my life, can we make that confession this morning? Yes. You want to make a confession? There's nothing, There's nothing. that has room, has room in my life, in my life. Other, than other than God's word. God's word. Okay, you confessed it. Yes. You said it. So I believe this, that it's not just so that we can... Uh, you know, just do what we want to do. But I'm going to promise you this. I'm going to try to close here. There's going to be a lot of things that God's going to bring you to that's going to make you really uncomfortable. Anybody ever went to the gym before? For the first time ever? What you feel like the next day? What do you want to do? Quit. <laughs> but then, you know, you see guys like Drew... And you're like, I gotta keep going. <laughs> I gotta keep going. But I'm gonna tell you the next day after, you're like, whoo. I did not know I had muscles there. I didn't know that part of my body existed. I did not know that whenever I lifted things, there were things in my legs that retracted. I did not know that. <laughs> but I found out that way. Well, that's uncomfortable, but you know what? When you turn if you take care of your body and you come into an understanding of taking care of your body and then when you turn 80 years old, you're not stove up. I mean, you know, I'm not trying to be mean about it. It's just that's the design. Well, it's the same way with the Word of God. There are some things that He's going to bring us to that at first, you mean i got to go to church every Sunday? Well, no, you don't have to do nothing. But when I come in here and I hear pastor teach on something, and I'm like, that's what I've been dealing with this week. Yeah. Oh, wait a minute. That's the design to build me up, uh, to, to refine me, that the, work, that the man of God can be furnished. So there's going to be some things that God brings us to that might make us uncomfortable, but it's, it's not for the sake of you being uncomfortable. It's for the sake of getting you to be a better person. Amen. This has been Living Faith from the Russellville Christian Center. We pray that this message has uplifted, encouraged, and motivated you today. You can find us online at rccenter.org or visit us at 305 Lakefront Drive, Russellville, Arkansas.